Um, I think uh, I think my work actually as a musician in New Orleans is what ironically kind of what led to me being interested in this because the orchestra in New Orleans has been a cooperative for several years. In other words, the players are involved in the governing of the orchestra uh, in New Orleans, but also the operations. So I think, you know, get, being involved as a musician there, but also being involved in the running of the organization kind of started me thinking about the larger issues, not only for that orchestra in particular, but for other orchestras. And um, so I think that, that worked for me. Uh, I was playing, obviously, simultaneous to, you know, working on the executive committee and at the orchestra there got me interested. And then I, I really, just as chance would have it, I went to the Breckenridge uh, Music Festival in Colorado. And, uh, and it really was kind of on a lark more than anything. But it, it, it gave me yet another opportunity to see what was happening. I worked as a music librarian the first summer there. And then they asked me to come back a subsequent summer uh, to be the production manager for the festival which was really nice. I was really glad to have the opportunity. And so really without a whole lot of direct experience, I took on, you know, the production, all the production for a summer festival, which was a little bit intimidating at first, but there's no better way in this business to learn than just rolling up your sleeves and getting in there. So I did that. I was still a member of the orchestra in New Orleans. Uh, but then I really, at that point, then I was really thinking, wow, this may be something I really am interested in doing more long-term and, and as a full-time career in place of playing. And I had some people like Carol Winsens, the flute player, and uh, a few other people who were really helpful in encouraging me on that front. So that's, you know, that's, the, that's my theme, is that I've had great people along the way who've helped me and encouraged me. So really from that point then, I knew that I wanted to make some sort of change professionally. And um, as again, you know, luck plays a lot. Uh, 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 luck plays a big role, I think, in everybody's life, but in mine. And um, I was here in Houston visiting for a week, and knew that you know the Houston Symphony was a great orchestra. And kind of just walked in the door one day and said, you know, do you think you might have something for somebody like me? And they said, well, yes, we would. <laughs> So um, I was still playing in New Orleans at the time. They offered me a job here to come on the artistic staff, and I, I took it. I, th I thought this was the right chance for me. And then really from there, I've just taken advantage of every opportunity I could to learn more about the business and get the experience that I, I could. And, and, and I've you know, had a lot of great opportunities here in Houston. Well, I mean, I was lucky in that being GM for a couple of years here helped me understand a couple of things. It helped me really understand where the orchestra was because the GM is in many ways the, 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 the person who interacts the most with the players on a regular basis. And um, both from a product, concert production standpoint and from a contract standpoint. And you really, you, you want to have and need to have a really close relationship and a close dialogue with the players. You need to know where they are on different issues and um, how they're feeling about things, both good and, and not so good sometimes. Uh, so I think that helped me understand them, but it also gave me a different, it, was, it allowed me to sort of see the larger organization, um, but, but not to be right, necessarily right in the middle of it. I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it allows you to look at the board and the larger financial issues um, because the executive director and board leadership are ultimately responsible for those things. So it gives you some perspective. Um, certainly here, I felt more comfortable taking on this role because I had been in-house. I had relationships with people in the orchestra, obviously with people on staff, and, and I'd had a growing relationship with people on our board. So I felt that coming from the inside, actually at this point in Houston was actually optimal Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's much easier to ascend to a, the, the leadership position um, coming from outside. I mean, I think you see this in a lot of organizations where sometimes to move to that next level, you actually have to go somewhere else. And I felt very fortunate on a couple of fronts that I could make that jump here. Um, and I also had, of course, the real advantage of knowing what I was getting myself into, for lack of a better description. The, the, the greatest challenge for an arts manager, but especially for an orchestra manager, is one of balancing priorities. 
there is no question a business element in what we do. I mean, we, we are a business. Uh, we may be a nonprofit, but we are being asked uh, by the funding community and also we're driving ourselves internally to run many aspects of what we do more like a business, to be efficient, to be um, uh, savvy, savvy from a marketing standpoint and from a sales standpoint, uh, to be uh, professional in terms of how we raise money for the organization. So we're, we're, we're really adopting, I think, more and more arts, arts groups have been adopting more business practices uh, over the last many years. Uh, but the balancing act is really, at the end of the day, we are still an arts organization. We're, you know, we're, we're an arts entity. We, we have a mission that's not about bottom line. It's not about financial success. Um, although financial success is a major component of what we're trying to do. So it's, it's balancing the mission of the organization in terms of what we want to achieve artistically in the community, in terms of our education and outreach programs. Um, all of those things balancing with good financial stewardship. So that's, that's, the, that's the key aspect, the thing that we have to always nurture and be mindful of is, is that balance. And, and, that, and that affects every decision from uh, hiring a specific, uh, a specific artist or soloist for a uh, given concert weekend to um, you know, uh, negotiating a catering deal um, it's amazing how much that, that balancing act permeates everything that we do. Talking about the Houston Symphony, um, I think our, our greatest strengths right now are that A, the orchestra is really first rate. I mean, the, the orchestra plays really, really well. The artistic level has been very high for many years and continues to be so. So we're very lucky in that we have, a, you know, what I would call a first rate product on stage every week. Um, closely tied to that is that we're not just a first-rate product in terms of great classical music, which is, of course, our bread and butter, our core activity. We're, I think we're doing things first-rate across the board, across the musical spectrum, um, in our classical programming, first and foremost, but also in our popular programming. We have a very elaborate pops product line series, if you will, um, here in Houston. We're doing more presentations on the popular front. We do uh, an enormous amount of family programming, educational programming, outreach programming. So we really, I think we do a great job of extending our standards of excellence to everything that we do in terms of our performances here. Um, so I think that's, that's our greatest strength, and it's of course the strength that we have to continue to advocate for and, and trumpet out in the community, free of the pun, you know, out in the community when we're out selling tickets, uh, cultivating on the board and donor front. Um, that's, that's our central message. Uh, I think I'm really proud of the work that we're doing here right now because what our, our other greatest strength is that we're working more as a team here. Um, what I sort of call the Houston Symphony family, which can sound sort of cliche, but I think more than ever nonprofit groups, the, the ones that are doing well function as uh, an entire organization as a unit rather than as separate entities. We have several different groups of people that are working on our behalf. You know, I'm a member of our professional staff here, of which we have about 50 members. We have an orchestra, obviously, of close to 90 members. And those are two very distinct groups. But we also have board members, um, of which there are about 100 here at the Houston Symphony. We also have volunteers who do an enormous amount of work, and they number over 400. Um, in terms of the volunteer base. And then, of course, we have our audience members, which we never want to <laughs> forget in all of this. But it's, it's about those groups working together, you know, rowing in the same direction, if you will, that's really important. And, and I, I, I will be candid and say that that has not always been the case here at the Houston Symphony. And you can succeed as an organization without those internal groups working together, but you can have much, much more success both internally and externally with the, with the larger community when everyone's working together. Some days it's easier to build it than others. Uh, one, one is making sure that everyone understands and shares the goals of the organization. You know, whether it's, you know, whether it's a specific event that the organization is working on or a, a larger planning effort within the organization, the, the challenge is to, to create input, buy-in, understanding and ultimately sharing and uh, um, of, of, of those goals and understanding that 
the, the organization is doing something bigger than any one group or any one individual. And so, I mean, how, you, how, you, how do you achieve that each and every day? One, I think, is through example. I think um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's really about the we here more than it's about the me, which is, of course, a you know, real business philosophy more that's growing more and more each day. But I think in nonprofit, it's, there's always been a strong need for that. And, and um, I know that I need to show and show leadership and show an example for my staff. Uh, for my board members, but then I also need board leadership and people on the board to do that. And within the orchestra, we have some wonderful players who have stepped up in a leadership role who have said, you know, this is about the organization, not just about the orchestra. The orchestra is obviously the core of what we do, but that they understand the organization's entire goals, uh, their, the organization's opportunities, the challenges that exist. Um, and so I think it's, it happens hopefully somewhat organically. It hope, ho hopefully it happens that when people start talking more openly and there's more shared information and that there's um, a, a mechanism or a, a, a forum, if you will, for people to be able to share their ideas and their concerns and their suggestions, then you start to create kind of organically this, this working together. And it, it has to be nurtured every day. I always feel like the first thing I, I, the first thing I wanna know is you know, in thinking about a hiring decision, and of course I'm involved extremely closely on the hiring of senior department managers here um, because they're my, they're my direct reports. So, um, but I'm also involved in select hirings throughout the organization as well. And it may or may not be the, the best approach, but I always want to know what kind of person somebody is, maybe first and foremost. I mean, their background is obviously very important and their, their work and their progression is, is uh, obviously very material to whether they can succeed in a role. But, you know, I think sometimes more than anything, it's, it's seeing the person's demeanor, their drive, their sense of ambition, their sense of hunger, if you will, uh, to, to not only learn, but to succeed. And I think for me, that's always one of the first things I wanna kinda see and get a sense of from someone. Um, in terms of seeing a career progression, I think the, the, the good news about the arts industry is that there's some latitude on that front, that there's, that organizations will, will take a chance, so to speak. I mean, I, I think I'm a good example of that, actually. I think the organization here has taken a chance on me on, on a couple of fronts. And I think while it's not always easy for an organization to do, there, there has to be some risk taking in hiring. And it works, it can work very much so for the organization who's hiring, but it can also work for the person who's being hired. So I think it's, it's important to always take those opportunities when you're coming up as a professional. It's always, you know, you want to be thinking about your career and how you manage that progression. But you also have to know when you might have an opportunity that wouldn't present itself. Otherwise, you may just be in the right place at the right time and in the right situation. And if you feel that you can take that risk personally, um, it can be very advantageous to do so. But it's a hard decision to make. It's a really, it can be, it can be, I mean, for lack of a better word, it can be very intimidating and very scary. I think there are certainly some changing trends overall in the music business. I think we've seen that. I think um, there's certainly been a lot of talk up until recently that, you know, perhaps uh, art, art music or classical music um, is in jeopardy. Its future is in jeopardy that um, perhaps people are moving finally away from, you know, this older music, seeing it as, you know, uh, you know music that's not relevant to a lot of people. But I, 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 I've always felt deep down that that wasn't necessarily the case. It's, if you, if you went back 50 years, you could probably find similar articles that spelled out the gloom and doom of, of music and art uh, in society. And I, I think there are many things to worry about on that front. I think we as an orchestra, and as a, an, an organization that fosters the performance of art music uh, in a live way, have to find as many ways as we can to not only share our music with people, both live and in recording, but to find new ways to make ourselves relevant to some people who maybe are 
doubtful that there's anything that the symphony would bring that they would understand or even enjoy. And that's a really complicated issue. I mean, there's, you know, that, that whole issue of cultural relevance is one that no one knows the answer. There's no silver bullet. There's no, there's no switch that's flipped on where we all of a sudden have this problem solved. And, you know, we go at it in a very, in several different ways. We, we of course, make great classical music accessible to a lot of different people and a lot of times for free or at very, very low cost. And this is something orchestras have been doing for a long time, but we have the obligation to make it as relevant and as exciting and as inviting as possible. Uh, it's not just, well, let's have a free concert and, and people can come and they don't have to pay anything. It's, it's a real effort to embrace that performance opportunity as an invitation for people. And we've done a lot of this with concerts, but also in, you know, uh, on the marketing team has done a lot of s sampling work. They've, they've, they've made the invitation to people through direct mail and through other offers where they're saying, come and try what we do. I mean, this is no different than what happens when you receive a sample in the mail from, for laundry detergent or, you know, you, the, half the battle is getting someone to try the product. And if they've not grown up with the project, the, the product, in this case being music, if they haven't been around music, then it's, it's a big step for a consumer to, especially in the orchestra arena, to try. So, you know, there's, there's that side of it, which is just the trial of what, of what we do each and every day. And then there's kind of finding some new avenues to get people here and to ex experience what an orchestra does. And this is maybe a slightly more controversial avenue, but I think one that frankly drew me to this side of the business maybe more than anything else, which is an orchestra in particular has such great flexibility in what it can do. I mean, we're, you know, we've just done concerts over the last week where, you know, we were playing Stravinsky's Firebird and uh, Prokofiev Classical Symphony and Sibelius Violin Concerto, and tomorrow night we're doing a concert with Winona Judd. And many people would say, well, are you, are you, you know, are you cheapening what an orchestra does? I, I don't think so. I think she's a great performer. I mean, we, we always hold our guest performers to the highest standards. And so as long as an artist is really great quality, we're interested in exploring different avenues of music with them. And, you know, we'll have hopefully several hundred people here tomorrow night who've never been to the Houston Symphony before who are coming to hear Winona Judd, but knowing that it's a special opportunity for them to hear her with a full symphony orchestra. And we're not going to get those same several hundred people to c become subscribers tomorrow, but we will have touched them in a way that we hadn't before, and they will then have maybe at least a, a better understanding that this is their orchestra here in Houston, not just the Houston Symphony that that you know doesn't really necessarily impact my life. So I mean that's just one single example, and there are probably a dozen others, you know, on the on a kind of more commercial side of programming where I think. We're, we're, we're creating two opportunities for ourselves. One is to sell additional tickets and create earned income, but also to uh, have a new door or a new access point for, for audiences. You're, you're always challenging yourself, I mean, on every front. I mean, and the, when, when we talk about us being, you know, a leading orchestra and a leading institution here in America and around the world, it's, that happens in several different ways. It doesn't just happen from the quality of music on stage. That's our, that's the that's the foundation of that that charge. But it's in all the things that we do and how we market our performances and how we raise money for them, how we select, you know, our programs and what we do. Um, so that 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 drive that that path to achieving, um, you know, that that. It's, it's not driven by notoriety. I think it's driven internally by the knowledge that, that you're doing something that's very, very special that distinguishes the Houston Symphony as an, as an organization, but also distinguishes Houston as a city. I mean, we're part of the larger community here and we represent not only ourselves, but we represent Houston as a city. Um, so, I mean, th there's no, again, there's no easy answer to how you, how you find that path or even how you stay on it. It's, it's an evolving process each and every day. We're engaged in a long-term planning process right now, which will map out the next three to 10 years for the symphony in every aspect of what we do, 
marketing, programming, artistically, what we want to do, um, and what, what has to happen to achieve that. But even with a plan like that in place, it's, it's each and every day stepping back, saying, are we doing, are we doing the right things? Are we, are we being the, 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 as effective as we really can in this area, in this area, in this area? So it's a constant, one might call it a struggle, but it's really you're constantly challenging. It's no different than being a musician. It's, it's sort of the musical analogy, which is that if you reach a point as a musician where you're not, no longer trying to get any better, then, then that, that's a dangerous place to be because you always want to be striving for that next step. The greatest thing is to see players, you know, who might be considered in the twilight of their career or um, nearing, you know, a retirement age when they're still driving themselves to be a better musician. That's, that's a wonderful thing to see. And I sort of use that as analogy for us that we have to always be striving to be better.